Hello, and welcome to our Bernina webinar, Four Simple Designs for Beginning Free Motion Quilting. I'm Julie Bridgman, your host today. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can go ahead and type them in your questions icon. It's on the right side of your screen. It looks like a bubble. So go ahead and put your questions in anytime during the presentation. I will either respond or I will save those for the end of the presentation. If you have any audio or visual issues, the best thing to do is just to log or exit out of the webinar and log back in. 99% of the time, it's a connection issue on your end. Um, our presenter today is Nina McVeigh. She's been with Bernina for 16 years, and she serves as the long arm and quilting specialist. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Julie, and welcome to all of you out there. Uh, we are, as Julie said, going to be talking about four simple designs for beginning free motion quilting. I know I can sit down at my computer and start um, surfing the web. Uh, Pinterest always holds my interest, a lot of ideas, and I just love to look at quilting designs. They just kind of draw me in. In better times when we can go to quilt shows and look at quilts, uh, I love to do that, but often, a quilt will draw me in and then because of its whole presence, but then I start really looking at the quilting part. And, um, you know, we always aspire to, to be better no matter where we are in our quilting journey. I, of course, um, love Sharon Schomburg's work. She is an award-winning quilter, if you aren't familiar with Sharon's work. But for right now, uh, before we actually begin our webinar, I'd kind of like to know where you are on your quilting journey. So Julie, um, we do have a um, survey that uh, she, Julie's going to put up and we're going to find out where you are. Okay, the votes are coming in. Oh, that's quick. Good. A few seconds here. It looks like about 50% say they are a struggling beginner. Okay. And a quarter have never tried free motion, and a quarter say they can free motion quilts but would like to improve. Okay. Well, that that I think is a pretty average response. I don't want you to be a struggling beginner. I want you to be um, a confident beginner. Um, if you have never free motioned quilted before, I want you to uh, feel that you can get started and uh, you can only, um, you have to get started to get better. And of course, if you are trying to improve your skills, good for you. We are all trying to improve our skills as we go along. Let's first talk about equipment. What kind of machine are you quilting on? Whether you are on a long arm with 24 inches of space and we can uh, have 20 or 24 inches of space on our long arm, or whether you're, are, you are quilting at a table model long arm and we have 16 inches to 20 inches of space there, or whether you are quilting on a domestic machine. With a domestic machine in the Bernina line, we can have machines from just over six inches all the way up to 12 inches. So again, depending on what you are sewing on, space does make a difference when it comes to free motion quilting. It's also going to depend what size project are you quilting. If you are quilting smaller projects, then perhaps that larger space isn't as important to you. But if you are wanting to quilt full-size quilts, queen-size quilts, um, or bigger, then the more space you can have, the better, and I should say, the easier it will be for you to quilt that quilt. So just keep that in mind. Again, depending on what you are stitching on, you want the space. And then if you are quilting on a domestic machine, how is that machine set up? Because that's also important. Are you quilting at a machine that sits up on a tabletop? If that is the case, you probably are going to struggle a little bit more. Your learning curve is going to be greater because you have more to, to deal with and more to consider. 
if you are at a machine up on a table, you definitely want some kind of support around the machine. So your slide on table that comes with your machine. Uh, if you have another brand machine, I'm going to guess that perhaps you have a slide on table as well. That will provide some support, not a lot of support. So if that is the only way you can have your machine set up, on a, that is on a table, then I would suggest an acrylic table that would be made for your machine and give you more space around the machine. But even in this scenario, um, that acrylic table still has an edge to it and you are always battling um, your quilt falling off that edge. Of course, it's going to rest on the table, but you're going to have to make sure that there is no drag as it comes up off the table onto the acrylic table. So those are, there are ways that a lot of people are set up, but the best case scenario is to have your machine down in a table so that you have a flat surface, a much larger flat surface around your machine a much bigger space to support your quilt. It will be a lot easier because you won't have to worry about um, the other things like, like how is it coming into your machine. We also wanna look at the things that can help you move your quilt. As a quilter and as a machine quilter, I think a lot of us are always looking for that one magic notion that this is it, this is going to make me a better quilter. Let me share with you some notions that can help, but I would think, I think the magic lies in practice and uh, we'll get into that. So we have our super slider or our supreme slider, excuse me, and these come in several different sizes. There's a king size, a queen size, and then there's even a smaller one. But this is a silicone piece that's very slippery and it lays on the bed of your machine, has a hole in it that you would put over your needle hole in your throat plate. And then it has a little bit of a tacky surface on the back. So it will stay in place, but it's very slippery. So that is one thing that may help you. It will make your quilt uh, slide more easily across the bed of your machine. And then a lot of people like to use quilting gloves. Machiningers are probably one of the most common gloves. They're nice because they're lightweight and they breathe. Uh, but now a lot of people are looking for gloves that don't cover all their fingers. So we have the Reggie's Grip quilting gloves. And then I like the Amity gloves. They, um, again, don't cover all your fingers, but the palm of those gloves is padded and it is a suede-like material, so it grips your fabric very nicely. So whatever your favorite machine quilting gloves are, if you uh, don't have gloves yet, uh, you might want to consider it. The other thing that I learned a long time ago from a, um, an award-winning quilter, Diane Godinsky, is to use Aquaphor. Aquaphor is a hand lotion. It's non-greasy, but it seems to give your hands a little bit of a, a gripping surface on your hands. And so I have come to like that as well. There are other things that aids that can help you move your, your quilting project. Steady Betty has uh, what are called Betty Bands. And if you don't like gloves at all, these are nice because they wrap around your hand and they have a gripping surface uh, in the palm of your hand. And then we have a few other aids that have a gripping surface on the back side. You can sort of see a little bit of a rubber gripping surface there and you would just hold on to these uh, as, you, as you lay them on your quilt. And that would also help you move your quilt. The Bernina gripper rings are very nice because they um, also have a gripping surface on the back. They're heavy, so they're, they're real heavy duty. So you just can lay this down on your fabric, get a little tautness to that fabric, and then lay your hands over those knobs. Don't hold on to the knobs because that's not um, ergonomically correct. You just wanna lay your hands over the top of them. And then because they are uh, they look the way they look. A lot of people think, oh, they're like steering wheels and I'm going to steer this quilt through my machine. You still want to keep your uh, quilt parallel to the machine. So avoid using this like a steering wheel. 
These come in two sizes, eight inch and 11 inch. The eight inch is probably um, more easily used on a domestic machine unless you have the larger machine like a 12 inch bed on the Bernina uh, 880 plus and then the 11 inch works well. You'll notice that there is an opening in this ring which is very, very helpful to either add the ring or remove the ring without breaking thread. So that's also an advantage of the Bernina gripper rings. As we look at other uh, aids, we want to consider the, uh, the Bernina stitch regulation, whether you are on a domestic machine or a long arm. It is different between those two machines. So for your domestic machine, your Bernina stitch regulator is a foot. You put it on like a foot and then plug it into the machine. You'll see here there are three different soles that come with the stitch regulator. My preference would be the open toe sole, and that is the one farthest to the left as you look at my screen, and that just snaps on in place of the one that's already there. The other soles are great. I use them for different reasons, but for our beginning free motion, I like the open sole. And then if you look at my other picture, this is the stitch regulation on the table model long arm or the, the frame long arm. There are actually two stitch regulators and the, they are located in the bobbin area of the machine. As you see these yellow circles, you can see the stitch regulator lens. What this affords us is the opportunity to use any free motion foot that's available. So that's a huge advantage. I can use, um, any one of the of the many feet. So here I have open toe feet from the open toe embroidery foot. I have the adjustable stippling foot, and then I also have what is known as the quilting foot number 29. So uh, again, other feet are available. You can choose any free motion foot with the long arm. When we talk about stitch regulation, I want to talk a little bit about how stitch regulators work. There are different modes, and all that means is there are different ways that they react to your motion. A stitch regulator reads the movement of your fabric. So when you start moving your fabric, once you power your machine with your foot control or a stop start button, you need to move your fabric, and the stitch regulator reads the movement of that fabric and then it stitches accordingly. In mode one, the needle is in constant motion. So when you start your machine, the needle will start moving up and down. And when you, you'll move your fabric and the needle will move as fast as you are moving your fabric and keep up with you. When you stop moving your fabric, your needle will idle at a set speed. So it will continue to stitch up and down. Remember I said it's just a set idle speed. That set idle speed is adjustable on the Q-series machines. Mode one is great for points or square corners because you almost get an extra stitch right there. Well, you do get an extra stitch because you pause, there's a natural pause that happens. And that extra stitch is what gives you that sharp point or sharp corner. In mode two, when you turn your machine on or power it to start stitching, nothing happens until you move your fabric. You move your fabric, the machine stitches accordingly, um, stitches to the speed that you move your fabric. When you stop moving your fabric, the needle will stop in an up position and it will wait seven seconds to give you the opportunity to breathe or just continue on or um, think about your next path. After, if you do not move after seven seconds, it will automatically turn off. Mode two is good for curves and um, smooth, smooth things. And then mode three is a basting mode. It is only available on the Q-series machines on the table and frame long arms. The basting mode will stitch a quarter of an inch stitches, half inch stitches, and one inch stitches. So um, that is the Bernina stitch regulator in a nutshell. 
When you are beginning to quilt, one thing you need to remember is your hand position. This window that I'm creating with my hands, and if you take your left hand and make an L, and your right hand and make a backwards L, and then put your thumbs together, you've created a, your quilting window. The reason that works so well is because you have enough support around the needle area. If you get your hands further and further apart, you're going to get buckling of the fabric and perhaps even skip stitches because the fabric is flagging. So you want to be sure that you are keeping your hands within that window. You don't always have to keep your hands in that particular L shape, but you just want to keep that uh, size area in mind that your hands are that um, close to the needle to allow for that five or six inch window. Before we get started, I wanna talk a little bit about needles and thread. What kind of thread can you use? Any kind of thread. Really, um, there are so many choices out there. Try different threads, be brave, be bold, um, and just try different things. Typically, people are going to be using cotton or a cotton polyester blend. Um, I like to use cotton. I like to use uh, 50 weight Aurafil, 50 weight Mettler. I like um, a heavier weight thread, like King Tut is a cotton thread, and that's a heavier 40 weight thread when I'm doing uh, bigger designs or longer stitches. And I might like a lighter weight thread such as um, a 60 weight cotton when I'm doing heirloom quilting or very uh, close micro stippling. You can use embroidery thread. Embroidery threads are rayon and polyester. Rayon is not going to be as strong. I love isocord polyester embroidery thread. It does leave a nice sheen on your, on your quilt. And then there's lighter weight bobbin threads, there's piecing thread, which would be a 50 weight normally, and silk thread. Silk thread is absolutely beautiful, especially in your heirloom quilting. But the thread that you use does relate to the needles that you choose. So this little diagram that you see here, the top circle with the little red ball on the side, what that indicates is the, the little square box cut out of the circle is, um, the groove down the front of your needle. So this is the perfect size thread for this needle. If I used a very lightweight thread and kept the same needle, do you see that little red ball? That little red ball indicates the thread and my thread would be kind of bouncing around in that groove and that would cause thread breakage or wonky stitches. If I used a much heavier thread and did not change the size of my needle, then the thread would not properly fit in that groove down the front of your needle. That also can cause um, irregular stitches and broken thread. So as we look at needles, you, we know that we can quilt from uh, using size 70 needles. I've even gone down to 60 needles. Um, those are very, very small needles, all the way up to 100 needles or 110s if need be. But when we look at uh, those sizes, we've got different styles of needles. The needles that I have listed here all have sharp points. So that those are needles that I would definitely use in my quilting. So consider the different needles you have, the different sizes, and then the different points that you might have, and then how those relate to your thread. As far as batting, there are a lot of different kinds of batting to, battings to choose from. Cotton is probably um, the most basic batting. It uh, drapes well. It's a low loft batting. We have cotton blends like an 80-20 that you hear about, and that's normally an 80% cotton and 20% polyester. It's a little more loftier uh, than a regular cotton batting. And then we have polyester, which is again, a little loftier than the cotton and cotton blends. You don't want too high a loft. So you do want to be careful about that. The polyester is nice for uh, where you don't want shrinkage or uh, if you want 
like placemats and table runners, you, a needle punched polyester is always very nice. Wool batting is probably my favorite uh, just because it, it breathes, it's uh, very drapey and lightweight, and it shows off your quilting very nicely. Silk batting is always nice. Uh, and bamboo now, it's very, very soft. I will say the one thing about bamboo for those of you who are, um, who would like to choose bamboo because it's environmentally uh, friendly. Actually, it takes a lot of chemicals to uh, produce bamboo batting. So you might want to consider that in your choices. Once we choose our batting, and we have our quilt and our quilt backing, we have to base those layers together before we get started. And there are different uh, methods of doing that. There's the spray basting, of course. This is something that I use on a very limited uh, basis. I'm not real fond of the aerosol sprays, but if you're going to use them, just make sure that you are using them in a well-ventilated area, and they do work very nicely. And they're easy. They're really, an, it's an easy way to baste a quilt. Personally, I like to pin baste. Uh, I like to use the little, the small little gold safety pins. They're brass and they're very soft. And so I find them fairly easy to put in. And you can see here, those pins are spaced about a hand's width apart. But the disadvantage with pin basting is you have to stop to remove your pins as you are quilting. You could also thread baste. That's another option. But also remember that as you are quilting your quilt, and you have thread basted, you also should stop and pull out thread before you stitch over it. Because if you stitch through any of those threads used for basting, they will be much more difficult to remove. Before we go on, I do wanna tell you there is a handout for you uh, for this little bag that I've called Anna's bag. And it will um, it'll give you directions for the bag and the quilting are the four motifs that we are going to talk about. So I'll point that out as we go along. So let's get started. Before you ever go to the machine, um, I'm going to have you go to paper and I draw everything. I draw my motifs and I draw them over and over again until I'm comfortable. Every piece of paper you see uh, laying around me probably has a quilting motif uh, drawn on it. I draw when I'm sitting uh, waiting for a doctor's appointment, for a haircut. I draw when I'm watching TV. I draw when I'm sitting uh, in an airport. Anytime that I am sitting, I have paper and pencil or paper and pen and I am drawing. So the first thing that we are going to start with are wavy lines. Just gentle, easy, wavy lines. Because if you've never done any free motion, if you are a true beginner, you need to learn how to move your fabric both horizontally and vertically through the machine without the use of feed dogs. So we are going to draw wavy lines and I have a little video here and I'm just going to draw easy, smooth, wavy lines. When you get these pathways in your head, it will be a lot easier to stitch. So I will move my fabric vertically through the machine, back and forth, back and forth. And when I fill the area vertically, I'm then going to start horizontally. I'm not going to turn my fabric to stitch those lines. I am going to learn how to move my fabric horizontally. And I will be crea creating this nice wavy plaid. It's a very easy motif to do and one that everyone can be successful with. And again, gentle lines. When you get finished doing that, and you can do it several times until you're comfortable with that, then you're going to go to a practice piece. I keep several fat quarter sandwiches in my sewing room so that I always have a practice piece. And I will practice it on the practice piece to get that into my head. When you get to the machine, what you want to do to get started is to make sure that you have your straight stitch plate on, you want to lower your feed dogs. 
Some machines will do that automatically, others you will need to do it. Um, if you are stitching on a much older machine, um, uh, uh, not a Bernina machine, but a much older machine, you might have a cover to put over your feed dogs. So those you want to disengage those feed dogs. You are then going to pull up your bobbin thread. And um, even with the stitch regulator, you can set a stitch length. So when you do this particular pattern, you may want to try increasing your stitch length a little bit and see how that looks to you. Play with stitch length to see how it looks on any particular motif. And for this motif, we're going to be in BSR1. Now, try the different BSR modes. You may find you have a favorite, and if you do, then let the favorite one be the one that you choose. So here are my wavy lines going um, vertically up and down and the area of the bag of the little uh, bag that you have directions for is circled right there. That is the upper corner, left corner of the bag are, is going to be in this wavy plaid. So once you've all, done all your vertical lines, then you're going to do your horizontal lines. So it's just a small area and gives you some practice with uh, those wavy lines. Once with the wavy lines, I hopefully you have learned how to move fabric up and down and back and forth. And now we're going to combine those two movements to create our all over stippling. But we are going to draw that stippling first. So kind of an in and out and around and you're always taking the long way uh, somewhere if I want to move left, I'm going to go back and forth and up and down to, to get left. You want to think of different shapes. Uh, if you live in California or Florida, you might think of Mickey Mouse ears. If you live in Wisconsin or Montana, you might be thinking of antlers. If you um, do puzzles, you might be thinking of puzzle pieces. But always smooth, round edges that interlock together. Everybody will develop their own style of stippling. And you will practice this by drawing it. And if you're not happy with what you've drawn, draw it again and draw it again. I still stipple with pen and paper uh, just to, to doodle. If I'm on the phone, I might be doodling uh, stippling. But that just really gets it in your head. And once it, once it is in your head, you are going to practice it on your practice fat quarter. I would go to BSR2 for this, excuse me, this smooth design. And then you're going to go to your project. There are two areas on our little project that um, are all over stippled. So give that a try. It's just kind of in and out. Um, think about the way a child walks down a hallway. They don't generally walk in a straight line. They're from one side of the hallway to the other, and maybe they even uh, back up a little bit and go forward. So if that's what you want to think about, that and that works for you. But again, you will be most successful if you draw over and over again. As you look at our next uh, motif, you are going to take the stipple that you just learned and you are going to kind of put a rest in that stippling. So these are our swirls. And what I love about this is that, whoops, let me play that video. You are going to do those smooth surfaces, but as you come around, you're going to kind of stop and rest stop and rest. Do a lot of echoing of what you're already drawing. Come around and I notice that I don't want to box myself in so I'm going to come echo around, swirl, I stop and rest, come around, echo, do another swirl and rest, come back out, echo, and I would use BSR1 for this because as you rest, you're going to get an extra stitch in that point, which is going to make it a nice sharp point. 
So play with this one. It's really fun because you get that little rest in there. So again, just to review, you uh, have learned to stitch up and down and back and forth. You combine that into an all over stipple. And now you've taken um, that skill of an all over stipple and you've, and you've kind of put that rest in there. You've done more of a circular motion, but then you're resting to come out of that circle. So that is our swirl. And you're going to practice that on your practice piece, on your practice quilt sandwich. And then you're going to take that to the project that I've provided for you and fill in the large middle area. And this is, not only is this teaching you this design, this pattern, but it's also teaching you to work within an area. So you do have to look at um, where you are and uh, think ahead a little bit about where you're going to go when you get to the edge of the area. So it would not be a bad idea to draw a rectangle on a piece of paper and draw this pattern within that rectangle. I cannot emphasize the drawing enough. It is so valuable if you want to improve your free motion quilting skills. And then the fourth motif that I want to share with you, everybody wants to know how to do pebbles. Pebbles are simply circles. Whether they're perfect circles or whether they're misshapen circles, they are still circles. So as we look at the drawing video, you can see I'm drawing a circle. And then I'm going to use the edge of the circle to travel. So I draw a circle, come down the side, draw the next circle in the opposite direction, come down the side, draw another circle. And now if I don't want to, to um, stay in a straight line, I am going to use the edge of my pebble to travel. And now I can do some filling in. Probably one of the hardest things about a pebble design is staying on the previously stitched line. If you find that difficult, then go around the pebble several times. Lay purposeful thread work that is not all on top of each other, and it will look like you did that on purpose. And then as you improve, you will start getting, uh, start being able to stitch right on top of um, the previous pebble. So as you look at my practice pebbling, none of it's great, but um, with this, and I've got red thread on white fabric so you can see it, but I would start stitching around those pebbles several times so it would look like I purposely um, wasn't trying to stay on top of the previously stitched line. And then I have a row of pebbles because on our bag, you are going to have a row of pebbles. So you see them there and you can see I've started uh, at the top of one circle and I've come around and stitched down the um, side, gone in the opposite direction for the next pebble and down the side again and in the opposite direction. Now, another way to perfect those pebbles is to do them with ruler work. You are still learning the process and the uh, the pathway because even with ruler work you're going to do full circles and then travel um, again down the side. So you'll see here that these were done with a ruler. I have a ruler that has a half inch uh, opening but I'm still going to have to travel around the full circle and down the side around the full circle and down the side and just keep advancing your ruler as you do that. And you're going to find those, whoops, you're gonna find those in this narrow strip on the bag that I provided for you. So with that, we can look at those four techniques again. So you're starting out with wavy lines and I might do wavy lines on several different projects. I might take a fat quarter and do wavy lines uh, and fill an entire fat quarter to practice. The all over stippling, definitely 
fill an entire fat quarter with all over stippling. So prepare those fat quarters. I'm sure you all have fabrics that perhaps you purchased years ago and it isn't your favorite fabric anymore. Use that up. Um, go ahead and make your quilt sandwiches. You may have batting from other projects that you can make quilt sandwiches with. And practice, practice, practice. And I do count the drawing in that practicing. So draw and practice. So you have the, uh, again, wavy lines all over stippling, the swirls, and then the pebbles. As you practice those motifs, I do want to point out to you that on Bernina's uh, blog, We All Sew, there is a project for placemats. And you, as you look at these placemats, you will see that these are the motifs that we talked about today. So this is designed in the same manner. And this is a great project for practicing those techniques that we just went over and those motifs that we just went over. And the directions are all there on the We Also blog. So as far as the keys to success, drawing is, I think, a number one key and practicing. We, um, none of us were born playing a piano. If any of you do play a, the piano or an instrument, you had to practice. So we're going to practice and we're going to relax. I didn't talk about relaxing, but it is important that you relax. One of the things that I think helps you relax is the drawing, because now you know your pathway. You have an idea in your head before you ever go to your fabric on how you want to move over the surface of your fabric. So draw and practice and relax. If you need um, the right music to relax, put on that relaxing music. If you need a cup of hot cocoa to relax, then do that. If you need something in your hot cocoa to help you relax, then that's an option for you, or a glass of wine, or whatever it might take for you to relax. Roll your shoulders and make sure that you're not getting too tight in your shoulders. You want to draw again and practice and draw. So with that, Julie, do we have any questions? Yes, thank you, Nina. We have several questions. The first one is in regards to thread. Are there special considerations for thread weight and using metallics? Uh, well, um, I don't think there's a consideration about the weight of the metallic. As long as the thread can go through a needle and is meant to go through a needle, a machine needle, um, I don't know if you're referring to different weights of metallic thread. Of course, the heavier the thread, and this is true of all threads, metallic or not, the heavier the thread, the more it's going to show in the quilting. And if that is your goal, using a heavy, uh, heavier metallic thread, I would just make sure that I was using a needle that's going to uh, help you with that metallic thread, whether it is a top stitch needle because it has a larger eye or um, metafil or metallica needle designed for metallic threads to keep the heat down. Um, I have quilted entire quilts with metallic thread. You just have to be willing to um, to put up with a few things that metallic thread can hand you, like perhaps um, thread breakage, I think on a whole quilt, my thread broke, my metallic thread broke three times. I thought that was fine, but I don't have any uh, special considerations for different weights of those metallic threads, except for uh, the right needle. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about universal needles? Universal needles are fine. Um, I do like a sharp point. Uh, if a universal needle is working well for you, that's just fine. I gen I generally use a jeans needle because it has a sharp point or a or a microtex needle, but universal are fine. Okay, great. Uh, do you recommend tracing over the fabric, possibly tracing over to start the learning? So I think she means um, tracing. Draw, on the 
recommend drawing on the fabric. Yeah. yeah, I don't necessarily recommend drawing on the fabric because I think you lose the flow of the quilting because you're concentrating so hard on staying on the line. And one of the hardest things I think to do is to stay on a drawn line, uh, quilting on a drawn line. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. I would just keep drawing it till you get it in your head and then go to your fabric. And um, and so again, I think on, if trying to stay on a line, you get too tight in your, you know, you, you get tight and you don't relax and you don't get the flow uh, that uh, you would get otherwise. Okay. Can you use a ruler with the stitch regulator? Uh, can you use a ruler? No, uh, there is no ruler sole and those are all snap-on soles. There is not a ruler work sole for the stitch regulator. It's just the mechanics of the regulator and being low to the to the fabric. You could, wouldn't be able to get a ruler around the back of it, which is necessary for ruler work. So uh, no, you, you cannot use a ruler with the stitch regulator. I find I try to quilt too fast which results in thread breakage. Do you have any suggestions? Slow down would be my first. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> uh, if you are a fast quilter, um, boy, if you know you're getting thread breakage because of your speed, you're gonna have to control your speed. That's just number one. Um, that's the only suggestion I have for that. Well, what are other reasons that you might um, get uh, your thread breaking at the top, your top thread? The top thread breaking? It yeah. can break because the, your top thread can break because you have the wrong needle. Either it's too big and your thread is flagging and breaking, or it's too small and your thread is getting worn. Perhaps the needle is dull. Uh, perhaps the eye of the needle has a burr in it, and that can happen with a brand new needle. So, um, you know, you can check that out. If the eye of the needle has a burr in it, you just need to throw it away and, and put in a new needle. Um, it can be bad thread. I mean, if you are getting breakage with the same thread, same spool of thread, is it an older spool? Even if you just bought it, was it sitting on a store shelf for a long time? So those are things you want to consider. Okay, great. Also, when, when do you use each of the various quilting feet? What are the advantages of the open foot versus the plastic one? Okay, good question. I like an open foot for visibility. And I think when you're starting out, that visibility is so important. You want to see what you're what you're stitching. But then um, the quilting foot that was the closed uh, clear foot that you saw earlier in my presentation, that one's nice too. Uh, it's it sometimes it may be you choose one over the other because that's the one you have. But then also we have uh, feet clear um, feet that have more of a scoop to the sole and those are the type of feet, there are several of them that you might choose to um, glide over seams if you have heavy seams in your quilt. If you're quilting a flannel quilt where you have heavy seams, you will want a foot that is going to glide over those seams rather than get caught in those seams like an open toe foot would get caught in those seams. Um, so, you know, it's just, you know, there, it, there are always choices, but again, an open toe foot is going to give you visibility. A closed sole with a little bit of scoop to it is going to give you that gliding over seams and um, the other feet kind of lie in between. All right, what are good projects to turn your practice fat quarters into? <laughs> Wow, that's a good question. Kind of depends on uh, what you're doing. Um, do you have a humane society that a lot of them will collect those quilted pieces for um, their their animal beds, for their kennels, for kennel quilts? 
that's always a good place to donate them. Uh, a great way to practice uh, instead of fat quarters might be a panel, a printed panel. Those printed panels can be then uh, bound and donated to your local um, charities that provide mm -hmm. quilts for children um, they can go to, to um, homeless shelters, they can go to police departments who often give a child a quilt when there's been an accident or something has happened. So those are um, options for you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Do you have any other recommendations when you're practicing your free motion quilting and it's just not really smooth and you're still getting it so it's still a bit jagged looking um i, I know you practice. don't want to hear i was going <laughs> to say I, I know you don't want to hear it but practice 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 um i would say i i would look at my setup as well am i on top of a table where i have a smaller surface to support my quilt uh, you know, again, the best case scenario is having your machine in a table. Um, again, looking at your setup, you know, are, are you using something to help you move your quilt? Are you using quilting gloves? Are you uh, using a slider on your on the bed of your machine to make it easier to move your quilt? I think one of the things that happens in free motion quilting is we do get a little tense when we're starting out. And so uh, the fabric doesn't move quite as well as you as you would like it to so you press down harder on it to move it and then because you're pressing harder you're just multiplying the problem of it not moving so so it's not just in the stitching it's also in uh your your how you're moving that fabric and and what aids are you using to help you move that fabric but the bottom line is going to be practice and and i would recommend if you are a beginner save some of those beginning practice pieces so you can see your improvement. So you can see, oh my gosh, I don't love what I'm doing right now. I'm still learning, but look at how far I've come. So I think those are always good reinforcements. Great, great advice. Well, thank you so much, Nina. And um, I just wanna mention that the webinar recording and the handout will be available on Bernina.com. Just give us a couple days to upload all the information and you will find it under the learn and create tab also while you're on the website go ahead and sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already if you sign up for the newsletter then you will receive emails that will tell you about all of our upcoming webinars so um Oh, another website I wanted to tell you about and I think Nina mentioned it earlier was the we also.com that was where you can find her placemats. On there is, that's the Bernina Creative Sewing Blog, and you will find a wealth of information, everything to do with sewing and quilting. So thank you so much, and thank you, Nina, for such a great presentation. We hope you join, enjoyed the webinar today, and everyone have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank Bye. you, everyone.